Welcome everyone to the HDH Church podcast. My name is Toby. I'm the curate here based at Holy Trinity Church in Hastings. And today I'm joined uh, by another very special guest and uh, even more special to me because it's my former teacher, Dr. Chris Tilling. Chris is a New Testament scholar and uh, a chess whiz, as I can see on my screen. You won't be listening to this, you won't be able to see it. And Chris is here today to help us go into our uh i can just see it just there. oh yeah oh yeah so you can yeah, yeah. <laughs> chris is here today to help us uh, as we go on our kind of deep dive into the book on colossians which we are looking at on sundays so chris i wonder if we could start uh, welcome first of all well thank you thanks for inviting me along toby good to see uh, you again and thank you especially because you've just uh, confessed to me that you're not feeling great so it's very kind of you to <laughs> to, to to give a bit of time uh, to this and um, chris i wonder if we could start if you could just tell us a little bit about you uh who is dr chris tilling what makes him tick and how did you end up doing what you do oh goodness well what makes me tick i mean i'm i'm primarily dad right i'm i've got two beautiful kids i've got a five-year-old girl and an eight-year-old boy and um uh, we live in a place called hawley not far away from gatwick I'm married to Anya, my German wife. We've been married for over 20 years now. And uh, I got into what I'm doing uh, almost 15 years ago. I, I was completing my doctoral studies, uh, my PhD, looking at the Christology of Paul the Apostle. And a friend of mine uh, alerted me to a, a job at a very new college that's just started called St. Melitus College. And uh, so I, I went along for the interview, fully expecting not to get anything because I, you know, it was my first ever interview. And uh, lo and behold, I've been there ever since. 15 years. Yeah, I know, right. As you mentioned there, um, you, would, you did your doctoral studies on uh, Paul's Christology. Uh, and you published a book called Paul's Divine Christology, which I have, which I've, uh, is, is well thumbed. Why, why did you land on Paul? specifically what what is it about paul that that attracted you to him well i mean there's two ways of answering this there's one that is retrospective looks back and and gives you a little bit of a spin but the the more honest answer has to do with the fact that i wanted to do something on early christology who is jesus and how did the early christians understand jesus and so i initially thought about doing something on the the gospels and paul but soon realized that for a doctorate, you can't do that much, that you're not even remotely feasible. So I had to choose one. And it made sense for me to focus particularly on Paul because there was a really important debate happening at the time. And I had something to add to that contribute, you know, to, to contribute to that discussion. And I suppose the retrospective answer, looking back, I intuited that. Jesus is central to Paul in a way that maybe hadn't been fully appreciated. Uh, and that was going to prove to be a seminal insight for me um, in the years that followed and certainly reflects um, in Colossians and what, what we'll talk about today. It almost sounds a bit of um, almost too simplistic to say, oh, Jesus is central to Paul. He's like first and foremost at the Paul's thought and at the heart of everything he's talking about. Yeah, and yet that gets so easily forgotten about. Absolutely, I mean we'll we'll talk about that today. You know that it's how we sideline Jesus when we're thinking about Paul is subtle but insidious, mm -hmm. and it's a joy to put Jesus back into the center and understand rather how Jesus is central, and um, because it changes everything. Absolutely, and that's been my experience uh, definitely in the last few years, and definitely studying at St. Melitus. Um, and so why why do you think that the the church especially and the church of today maybe uh needs to pay close attention to paul i mean paul obviously wrote the majority of the new testament that's a good reason enough but what what is it about paul that the church needs to heed it's a good question i well paul has always had a massive impact on on the church and shaped the church's theological imagination and therefore the identity of the church what the church thinks the good news is what it thinks mission is for the simple reason that that paul was the most important theologian in church history you know there's so much in in the new testament that's bound up with him and very often in our churches when we talk about the good news or the gospel what we really mean 
is a reading of Paul, mm. if you sort of push into it, you know. And so I think, therefore, Paul is load-bearing in a unique way for the, for the church. And as we wrestle with Paul and think afresh about what he thought about Jesus and the gospel, we are setting ourselves up for renewal in the church. That's exciting. It is. It truly <laughs> is. Yeah. I think um, Robert Jensen talks about the church is the, the people gathered around the cheering message, uh, the people gathered around the gospel. So, and, and if Paul is the gospel and if Jesus is central to what Paul was thinking about, we're really yeah. gathering around Jesus in a, in a, in a really exciting way. So we, we talked a little bit about the gospel there. Uh, how did Paul understand the gospel? What was the cheering message that Paul had? Oh, this really is the big question, isn't it? I, my, my experience of having taught Paul and his gospel for the last 15 or so years and worked on him for five or six years before that is that we tend to misunderstand right at this point. Um, so it may be familiar to many who will be listening, but many will think, well, the gospel for Paul is something like this you know you've got one box where we're we're filthy rotten sinners and and god is just and so god is going to punish us because of our sins because we should know better you know we're culpable and guilty sinners and we should know better through the way things are made because natural theology um but but because we 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 are so sinful we find ourselves in a dead end and so very often so our, our understanding of Paul's gospel begins there. It's completely wrong, by the way, in terms of how this begins. And we'll come back to this in a minute. But but then, so then the, the plan of salvation is we've got to get to the good bit, the good land. We've got to cross the bridge. We've got to get to box B where there's salvation. And we can only get there because God has made available uh, potential through the death of Jesus. There's particularly a focus on the cross um, at that point in a certain way anyway. Um, um, God has made available way of salvation, but we have to activate, uh, that we have to actualize by our faith, usually in, in most traditions, um, not always, but it's often mixed with baptism or some kind of sacramental idea, or maybe infused righteousness. I mean, there's different ways of articulating that. But yeah, and, and people will take, take Paul's words to say, uh, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. That Jesus right, that's God. it. Yeah, so it'll be a sort of sinner's prayer moment so that then you move from box A to box B and then you can, you're can you in right relationship with God and then you can talk about things like sanctification, the gift of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, whatever else it is. But you've got to get from A to B through this kind of transactional mode. Um, and uh, And then the words that Paul uses like faith, righteousness, works of law, tend to get fed into this system. Mm -hmm. um, and so that tends to be how we, we've often understood Paul's gospel. And, and I will say it as sharply as I can, um, if that is the theological vision determining how we read Paul's letters, we're not going to get very far. Mm -hmm. It won't help us. It's actually going to confuse more than it will clarify and lead to you know, ridiculous contradictions when we're reading Paul's letters as well. Um, so this, so what is Paul's gospel then, right? So let's get back to that. So if that <laughs> isn't, um, there's still aspects of that that are important, mm. need to be sanctified, if you like, brought back in. Um, the gospel begins with a, with a narrative about God um, who in generous and unconditional love sends jesus christ you know romans 5 8 while we, god demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners christ died for us so there's an unconditional element not mm. provoked by us or mm. our worthiness god in love sends jesus christ he assumes he takes on our enslaved adamic nature um that is the nature which is bound as a uh, uh, as in slavery to sin mm. and death mm. um and jesus is faithful to god even though he assumes 
that enslaved Adamic nature. He comes in the likeness of sinful nature. He became sin for us. I'm just picking up on language in Romans 8, 3 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He dies on the cross and that Adamic nature, that, that enslaved nature is terminated on the cross. But God isn't finished. God raises Jesus Christ from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit and seats him at God's right hand where he lives to make intercession for us. So in, initially, we're not quite at articulating Paul's gospel yet, hmm. but there is, there is a story of descent and ascent. God sends, Jesus descends, even to death on the cross. God raises him from the dead by the power of the Spirit, and he is now God's right hand on God's throne, sharing in God's sovereignty. That mm -hmm. story of descent and ascent is central to Paul's letters. Paul's gospel is this. That story is our story. That's Paul's gospel in a nutshell. We, we believe that one died, Paul said, therefore all died. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So in the death of Jesus, we all die. Mm -hmm. um, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, he says um, that we believe that we will be raised with Christ, mm -hmm. which is an astonishing thing to say. So our resurrection has already happened in the resurrection of Jesus. We are dead in the crucifixion in the crucifixion of jesus so we don't die to our own sins right as if it's through our muscular spiritual determination alone rather we participate in the death of jesus our faith is participation in the faithfulness of jesus our resurrection is participation in the faithfulness of uh, in the resurrection of jesus all of this is in romans chapter 6 um for example which people can go and have a look at later on mm. but it's thoroughly participational we live in the story of jesus we exist in the time of jesus christ that story of descent and ascent is our story and mm. that is the good news for paul which means that it is necessarily trinitarian at its heart it is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, or active agents, if you like. It is unconditional in its dynamic, because God has done this on our behalf, not while we were repenting or believing, but while we were still sinners. Mm. And it has a very, very strong account of sin in this view as well. The problem for this gospel, if you like, is that sin enslaves Mm. And, and we cannot break ourselves free. We cannot cut ourselves out of this. The sinful mind is hostile to God and cannot please him, says Paul in Romans 8. The previous gospel has a slightly weaker account of sin. Sin's problem is ultimately stuff we do that make us guilty. And so the solution is that we should be forgiven. Now, of course, that is a part of the gospel. But Paul's letters hardly ever talk about forgiveness um it, so you know already we should we should we should start to think oh hang on is there a disjunct here G luther has a beautiful commentary uh, on galatians which your listeners can download and listen to uh, for free his commentary on galatians is a classic there's some mad bits in there but there's some beautiful <laughs> bits in there and in in that commentary he constantly writes about how god has forgiven us and forgiveness is on you know almost every page to slightly exaggerate mm -hmm. but then you do a search for the word forgiveness in galatians and it's not there at all <laughs> because we we've, we've mobilized a different account of the problem and its solution to the one in paul the solution that paul presents is liberational mm -hmm. we are set free from the powers of sin and death because the problem is slavery um, and that happens in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in which we participate as agents of new creation. So that, in a nutshell, is Paul's gospel. We live in that glorious story. Yeah. And it's much more, um, it puts it puts all the onus back on into God's hands, really. It's not, it's, it's not based on our activation, our, our making something happen or moving so that God will do something. It's founded on the gift and grace of God, first and foremost, and in what Jesus does not necessarily in what we do because we're helpless to do anything that's right so the gospel isn't something potential the gospel is actual is factual and that's why we believe it you know our believing doesn't make something real that's just a misunderstanding it's illogical mm -hmm. 
Um, rather, it's then participating in the truth of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, which is why when Paul gets to the end of this description in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, be reconciled to God. Mm. It's not now God is going to be reconciled to you. Mm. God has done everything. And so the onus for us is to wake up and smell the coffee, to realize that this is the mm. glorious truth of the universe and to believe and to follow and to be passionate disciples, but not in a contractual kind of sense, but because we're all called to this job together in Christ, which is a which is a glorious thing. I find um, your good friend Douglas Campbell uh, wrote a brilliant paper on uh, contract versus covenant. Uh, yeah, and James that... Torrance. James Torrance so uh, wrote this paper. I put that in the back of the book on Douglas Campbell. Yeah, um, did Doug write one on contract and covenant? Well, he he wrote he wrote one about James Torrance's work. Okay, um, okay. That um, I think is really helpful because we so often uh, view everything in this kind of tit for tat contractual way. It's like, okay, right. if we do this, then God will do that. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is part of what I was talking about on Sunday. Like, if this, then that. Yes. Um, but the gospel is much more well because this, therefore that, because God has done all this wonderful stuff in Jesus on the cross for you already while you were still a sinner. Yes. Therefore, open your eyes and to it and. And absolutely absolutely wake up and smell the coffee as you put it yeah yeah which can be painful which can shape our shake our identity to its core this mm. isn't an easy thing you mm. know this this calls us to a life of discipleship uh, of following christ but following the one who loves us unconditionally which makes it a joy yeah absolutely yeah it does it is a real joy and so how, how does Paul, thinking, focusing back in on Colossians, how does Paul express that gospel in Colossians specifically? Wow. And what, what are some of the kind of maybe the unique theological contributions uh, of, that, of that epistle? Yeah. Well, there's a lot to say there. Um, <laughs> I mean, I suppose... You've got five minutes. Yeah, five <laughs> minutes. I mean, I, as you were telling me beforehand, you preached on, on Colossians chapter one and the the so-called um, hymn, if that's the right way of describing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, just look how Paul begins Colossians. You've got the, the, just the Trinitarian dynamic of Paul's language. Admittedly, spirit isn't mentioned as much as you would normally expect in Colossians. Mm -hmm. and, and you might argue that some of his, Paul's pneumatology, that is his understanding of the spirit, was going to develop as well over the years. It depends very much where you put Colossians in relation mm -hmm. to his other letters. But it's very likely to be one of the earliest, actually, not one of the latest, mm -hmm. um, which is it's commonly understood to be. But you've got Paul, um, an emissary of Messiah Jesus by the will of God to the saints and faith faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. And he goes on, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and so on. So right off, it's all about God the Father and Jesus Christ and being in Christ Jesus. Mm. And Paul uses this phrase so frequently, en Christo, in Christ. And so I mentioned earlier on that that story is our story. Paul's way of saying that is using the phrase en Christo, in Christ. Um, and of course, Paul is going to go on in chapter one, um, to talk about that Christ story. But let's just go on in that first chapter because this is where so much of it is being framed. Um, and he made known to us your love in the spirit. There you go. You yeah, have, there it is. There you have this beautiful um, accent on the Trinitarian lively dynamic of God in all of these things. You know, typically Paul begins by talking about who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, way before we get to a bunch of random injunctions about praying more reading your bible more or whatever else you know good things like that it's filled with beautiful trinitarian theology um uh, and colossians by the way and ephesians are a couple of of texts where paul does mention forgiveness and i'm grateful for that because i feel like a filthy wretch sometimes i, d I desperately meditate over these passages <laughs> daily just to you know if god doesn't hate me 
Uh, so he, you know, he delivered us. But notice he has rescued us. He has delivered us um, from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, mm. in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And then we get the, the beautiful Christ hymn, which is, this is Paul in a nutshell. It's all about Jesus. You know, if we, we can screw up our reading of Paul in a number of different ways, but we are, have a good chance of being inoculated if we keep that simple, that, mm. that central. It's all about Jesus. So that early gospel that we were talking about, the one, you know, box A to box B kind of thing, it doesn't begin with Jesus. It begins with us being sinners and understood in a certain way. Yeah, it begins with the problem. Yeah, that's right. And there's, there's some truth to that, but, but if we begin with the problem, Jesus is only ever a solution to a problem that has been set up independent of our thinking of who Jesus is. And that mm -hmm. is always going to lead us to error because Jesus is only then enter, entering in scene two in, in the play, but the characters have all been set up, if you like. Jesus is the play. Jesus is everything, mm. and that changes everything. And so in verse 15, he goes on to explain the magnitude of Jesus. And if that were to be, if there were to be any one major contribution that Colossians makes in terms of Pauline theology in scholarship anyway, how it's received, it's this. It's verses um, 15 onwards, where you get the, the canvas of God's story and history painted the name Jesus. And it's important to bear this in mind. There is no bigger story than the one that's about to be uh, explained. It's quite common in some evangelical circles, right, to say, right, the story of Scripture begins with creation, and then then there's the problem, and then Abraham, and, and then the covenant with Abraham, and, and then the, the patriarchs, then and so on and so forth. For Paul, all of that is right, for sure, but that is a tiny story inside the bigger story, mm. which is beginning in verse 15 of chapter 1. In who, uh, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him, all things in heaven and earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or perils. All things have been created through him, and get this, and for him through him and for him so abraham moses time itself is created through jesus christ and for jesus christ there is no bigger story than the mm -hmm. name jesus I and mean, this is mind-bending stuff and not what we expect. We expect Jesus comes along at this point in a sequence of events, but there's been plenty before, and there's truth to looking at it in that way. But ultimately, time does something else around Jesus Christ. Time is the creature of Jesus. And the scope of everything that we've just been speaking about is here elucidated. Paul uses the word all in multiple different ways in this hymn to explain the way in which God, uh, uh, Jesus reveals God, um, the way in which he creates all things, the way in which he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, that he's the head of the body, the church, the beginning. I mean, you can't get any more clear than this. The firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. That's the test for a good theology right there. Mm -hmm. But in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Not a bit of God. Jesus is not a bit of God. Jesus shows us, discloses us who God is in fullness. Um, there's no God hidden behind Jesus Christ, behind this extraordinary, unconditional event of love towards those who deserve nothing. This is God for Paul. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by yeah. making peace through his blood, uh, the blood of his cross. Um, I mean, this is just a setting up, if you like, of, of who Jesus is for the, for the Colossians, because they're struggling to understand their place 
their un the, the, their discipleship. They have a few discordant voices telling them different things. Um, some telling them that they need to do X, Y, and Z so that they can make sure that they're they're holy and right. Um, others who go the other way as well and are happy to be licentious and just to to give up on on living a life of discipleship. But Paul Paul just sweeps all of that off the table, all of the confusion, and center stage is Jesus Christ. That's the contribution of Colossians. It's, it's wonderful. It's really, really wonderful. Just uh, even just taking the opportunity to go and sit through it and look through it again and see how Jesus is is front and center, behind and before, left and right, up down, everything yes. orient, orients around around this this one pivotal point. And then I think um, we were talking about uh, Lincoln Half earlier, and he, he used to talk about how everything spirates, yeah, uh, right. as in in a spiritual spirate spiritual uh, way out from Jesus, the event of Jesus. That's everything it. happens around that. Yeah. Okay. So, what does that mean for us today? Reading Paul in the church. Uh, what does that mean for our practice and and all those things? How should we read it? And how would Paul want us to live out of that reality? Well, most of Paul's letters are all about that in 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 one way, shape, or form. So it's difficult to put it in a nutshell. Um, I guess I'd just emphasize two points because it corresponds to what we've been talking about. On, on the one hand, then, um, this means that Christian, our Christian life, our Christian discipleship, our understanding of what it is to, to grow in Christian virtues and die to sin and such like, is all about Jesus Christ. And not our faith in Jesus Christ, or of course that's all evoked as well, but I mean Jesus Christ himself, um, in whom we live and move and have our being. It's um, That would be the most important thing. So thankfulness, worship, it's all about the, the, this, this glorious triune God. And there's nothing particularly practical necessarily about that. I'm not trying to make the Trinity a means to an end, but just delighting in the sheer extraordinary love and perfect being of God is probably the most important thing that we can do. And we, we sit back and stay in awe of this story. And if we're not animated from that perspective, then we're probably just going to end up either in self-righteousness or despair or something else. That would be the first point I'd, I'd make. Um, but the second, I, I mean, I may feel a little bit like I'm sort of shoehorning this in, um, but I don't, I don't think it is, be because this story isn't just the story of the church. It's the story of the universe. It's the story of Jesus Christ. That means, though the, the, the church has a very special place in, in all of this, Christ is the head of the body, the, the church. Um, but, but what this story ultimately means is we are in solidarity with those around us. We're not these pious blobs you know, hovering above reality totally different from those who may struggle a bit with doubts or aren't sure about creepy weirdo Christians in church and all the rest of it. We are one with them. We're in the same boat, all of us. And there's an, uh, uh, Jesus is Lord of them as well as us. You know, it's, it's, there's solidarity in, in, in who we are and um, before the Father. Um, and I think that postures us to those around us in a particular way. It's not then a them and an us in an unhealthy way, but we can have a them and an us in a really redemptive way, in a way that emphasizes the fact that we're all in this together. Solidarity is, is a key theme, I think, in Paul's letters. He passes that in particularly in terms of um, Jew and pagan um, in his mission, um, but it, it, it all boils down to the, the same thing, I think. For in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male and female, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. And as Paul goes on to explain in Colossians as well, this has massive ramifications for who we are and our ident identity in Christ, um, as he gets into that as well in Colossians in, in, in depth. So those two things again. So basically... Jesus, 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 Jesus. Again, it sounds obvious, but that is that's that's it. 
And then it's the story of the universe. It's the story of everyone. Uh, therefore, how we frame anyone who's, in quotes, outside the church uh, is completely different because um, they're not outside anything. They're all inside Jesus. Yeah. Um, wow. Okay. Solidarity with those around us. Mm -hmm. It does change how we posture ourselves to other people. And it need not lessen our our yearning to talk about Jesus Christ and mm. mission and to preach Jesus Christ because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, but it puts us on equal footing here. Yeah. Yeah. It's still a cheering message. It's a very cheering message. More cheerful, yeah. arguably, than the box A, box B. Yeah. Uh, no other way of explaining that. Chris, thank, thank you so much for giving up your time today and for speaking to me uh, i feel very much enriched by this and i kind of long to to sit at your feet again as my <laughs> uh, uh, as a student um so thank you so much and your your enthusiasm and passion for for this and for jesus and paul all shines through so i miss that dearly and thank you so much bless you, uh, bless you and uh to everyone listening i hope you enjoyed that um, if you've got any questions, do feel free to email me and I can uh, just forward them on to Chris and, and I'll let him answer them <laughs> with all the all the spare time that he's got. Yeah. Um, uh, but thank you so much for joining us today and we'll see you again soon.